So thank you, Jenny, for being here with us today. Um, what I'd like to start off with is you've become one of the most in-demand Hollywood composers with beloved music for over 100 films, television series, everything from Batman, Edward Scissorhands, The Simpsons. But growing up, that wasn't what you always envisioned. And how did music come become, as you've put it, your accidental profession? Music came to me very late in life. Um, I didn't grow up with music around me. Um, by the time I was in mid middle school, I was pretty certain I wanted to pursue a career in uh, nuclear bi biology. <laughs> Although I'm sure I wouldn't have lasted long in that, but it just seemed like a cool thing back then. And, um, but it was science, it was all about science. And really the luck part was that um, my parents moved from one neighborhood to another in Los Angeles between middle school and high school. And so I started high school with no friends. I had to make new friends from scratch. And I happened to fall in with a kind of an arty group. And I realized that I'm like the only one in this group that doesn't play an instrument. I was like the non-musical member. But in that group of friends was um, a trumpet player named Michael Byron, who's still in New York writing and doing wonderful stuff. And uh, he was even at like 16 years old playing professionally and writing music. And he turned me on to Stravinsky, and suddenly it was like a whole new world for me. And Stravinsky led to Prokofiev, led to Shostakovich, led to Bartok, led to, you know. And then before I knew it, I was really, I know when I, when I first time I heard Prokofiev, I felt like this is just music from my blood. And, you know, I have Russian roots. And, uh, but I knew nothing of Russian music, and somehow it just felt like it was just connecting on this uh, deep kind of cellular level. And um, so two and a half years of high school, I didn't quite finish, <laughs> and uh, I got a diploma sent to me in the mail later. But uh, I, I had planned to travel around the world with a friend, and I decided I will secretly pick up an instrument and try to learn it. And so we both brought on this world travel. He bought an alto sax and I bought a violin. Also during that period of time, I became infatuated with a 30s jazz artist named Django Reinhardt, who had a gypsy violinist named Stefan Grappelli. And I thought maybe someday I could play uh, something of you know, Stefan Grappelli's. But I ended up... Um, by another coincidence, starting off this world travel in Paris, because my brother lived there uh, quite randomly, and I was practicing in his apartment one day, and I'd only been playing for about five months, and the director had come in while I was practicing. When I came out, he goes, why don't you come with us on the road? And I go, me? I was like, I'm, I can't play. He goes, yeah, you're good enough for us. And, uh, and I did. And I did my first performing and wrote my actually first couple of pieces. And uh, so it was all totally unplanned and unexpected. One year before that moment, I had never even picked up an instrument. And uh, it, was, it was just like suddenly, I, and, it, and then I spent a year traveling. Uh, never made it around the world, but I spent a year going through Africa. And by the time I came back, my brother had started a musical theatrical troupe modeled after the group that I toured with in France, which was called Le Grand Magic Circus. And he started a group called the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. And um, even though I arrived very ill with hepatitis and malaria and a number of other things, he goes, it's okay, you could take a couple of days off, then I'll bring you to rehearsals and you can start. <laughs> You'll be our musical director. And that's how I started in music. Wow. I mean, that leads me to ask about how you've spoken about your, how you jumped into film music in a sort of way and how film music was your education into so many composers. So yeah. could you speak more about that and how, how you learned of all of these composers through another lens? Well, it is in the six, seven years I spent with the theater group, we actually started getting better and better musically. Went from eight to 12 pieces and everybody had to play three instruments. So we could be a string ensemble, a brass ensemble, or a percussion ensemble. And it was a very weird group. But in the uh, string and brass stuff, I did a lot of, I was still infatuated with 30s jazz. And um, I wanted to do 
arrangements of early Duke Ellington work from about 1932, 33. And I figured the only way I'm going to get it right is to learn how to write it down. So transcribing Duke Ellington was my first time writing on paper. And at the end of those seven years, I wrote my first very ambitious piece. Uh, it was about a six, seven minute, 12 written for, you know, all, all, all everybody in the group. And um, I called it the Oingo Boingo Piano Concerto number one and a half. But uh, it was kind of inspired by bits of Prokofiev and bits of Stravinsky. And, uh, and it was my first time writing, in fact, you know, like a small chamber work. And after that, I disbanded completely and started a rock band. And then years, five years after that, uh, Tim Burton brings me into Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So I almost said no, but I remembered writing that one piece, the, uh, the last piece I wrote for the Mystic Knights. And I said, well, if I can write for 12 pieces, I can write for an orchestra. It's not that different, because, you know, uh, I finally thought about it and I said, you know, it's a 65 piece orchestra now, but I'm not writing 65 individual parts. You got your first violin, second violins. And I said, it, and, and I just decided I'm just going to take a chance and do it. But I knew nothing about that either. Um, never dreamed of becoming a film composer. I was just a lot of random accidents in my life. And uh, I just had so much fun writing Pee Wee's Big Adventure that I said, oh, I'm going to keep... And it's also the first time I ever stood in front of an orchestra. Wow. And the sound was so amazing. It was pretty addictive. I think right at that moment, I was like, I want to do this. Something locked into place. Yeah. So for 10 years, I was both in a rock band, writing and producing and uh, performing and touring. And But I tried to get in two films every year around my band schedule so I could learn. So in those first 10 years, I did a number of albums and tours, but I also tried to get 20 film scores in there, more or less. And, uh, and that's kind of how it all began. Well, how did you go about writing out those film scores in those sort of early years, those first decade or so? Um, were you still doing things by hand? And how, how was that? Everything was by hand back, you know, this was 1985. There wasn't MIDI notation or anything like that yet. So I would kind of attempt the best I could to play parts into a tape recorder to play for the director because I wasn't a pianist mm -hmm. and and also Tim you know and other directors they want to hear they were getting to the point in the old days Bernard Herrmann would just play on piano for Alfred Hitchcock here's your themes here's how it goes but they wanted to hear more of what it's going to sound like so I started getting s cheap sample synthesizers to kind of mock up strings and brass and I found myself recording all the parts and getting the cue approved and eventually after a couple of scores i realized that i'm mocking up the entire cue before the director signs off on it and then when he finally does i'm going back to square one and writing all of it down and uh, i think it was working with an, a conductor on a film it was my first film with sam raimi i think called dark man and he said to me you're doing the whole thing twice. You realize that. You're working out all the parts on tape, and then you're listening, and you're writing them all down again. And it's true. I was working 16 hours a day, like seven days a week. It was crazy. Um, and <clears throat> so finally, it, it was that transition of the era, era in film music between playing something on a piano and directors going, no, I really want to hear it orchestrated. I want to hear what it's going to sound like. I need to hear what the brass is and what the strings. And, and it's where we composers had to really learn to mock things up, to really sound as close as possible to what the orchestra was going to sound like. So that was my first 10 years was very intensive training. And also, was still in the band during those 10 years. So it was, it was just insane. But slowly, I built up my confidence. And then I remember... There was that point after, I think, about 20 scores where MIDI notation was possible. So, because now I'm getting, I'm really spending a lot of time mocking up all the orchestration arrangements of the piece. So they hear it, they could close their eyes and imagine just what it's going to sound like. But I didn't have to go back to like oh, the first note of bar one all over again. I mean, I just used to, 
you'd look at me and I was covered with eraser dust. You know, it was just my hands were cramping and I had tons of pencils and I had my custom music paper made and my knees, I'd look at a certain point, I, just, <laughs> I was just going through erasers after erasers, you know, like changing stuff and getting it right. And so I was very happy when the MIDI notation happened and then I would just put a lot of work into creating the full fleshed out uh, version and then being able to get the MIDI to uh, print out that I could then take it the next step there. And my 16 hour days then went down to nice, easy 11, 12 hour days. <laughs> Little more manageable. Changed my life. Well then, uh, how, what motivated you to start writing concert music um, after all these years of writing film music? You know, I just have to keep challenging myself. After 10 years, now I'm just a film composer for the next uh, 10, 15 years. And it was starting to get frustrating because the thing is, I love writing for film, but it's also very, you can't write what you want to write. You have to write what serves the film. And so many times I'd be writing a cue for a film and, um, and it ends. I go, oh my God, that was just like a minute and a half or two and a half minutes. And I could have taken that you know, to eight minutes long and, and really enjoyed it. And so, um, there was a point where we started touring uh, live concerts of my film music. It was called Music from the Films of Tim Burton, 15 film suites. And I would look at the audience listening to it. And I remember we were at the Lincoln Center in New York and um, somebody came from the other side, you know, from the opposite side. He says, God, kill to get that audience in the <laughs> for our concerts because it was a very enthusiastic audience. And that's where I started thinking, why not try to write music that bridges between what I do for film and what I love about classical and just give myself this huge challenge. And so the first piece was for uh, American Composers Orchestra in uh, Carnegie Hall and, uh, and that was great. And I did a few more and then it wasn't until eight years ago that I decided I'm writing a violin concerto, my first and I'm gonna do a piece every year, which means I'm gonna start saying no to paid work, but it felt right because I knew it was gonna take my income down uh, significantly, but yet I did so well as a film composer, it felt like I should be giving it back also on the other side and keeping myself sharp because writing the classical, the concert music is so much harder, like infinitely harder for me than writing a film score. Because you know when you're writing a film score, inevitably things get simplified and condensed. And um, I used to argue with this conductor who worked with me in Elton Breed, he says, film music is the classical music of today. And I go, no it's not. People come to a film music concert to hear music from films they love. You can't take the films away from it and still have an audience really show up to hear that music. Not only that, but frequently we really have to simplify. And I'm not allowed to get in. Occasionally, there are scores that can get very dense and elaborate, but it's not often. You know, I'll write a certain thing and I'm really excited about it. And the director goes, oh, God, what's that? I go, sorry, let me just take the counter, <laughs> take all the dissonance out, take the counterpoint out. <laughs> How about now? Oh, it's much better. Thank you. So it was just the ability to get away from that and really push myself further. And... Uh, and it, it keeps me going because like when I finished that violin concerto, I felt like it almost killed me, literally. And I, um, I said, I'll never do it again until the next year. <laughs> when I was offered another piece, I said, sure. <laughs> and I realized, okay, you know, so it's just like childbirth, you know. My mother, I think after my brother was born saying, no more children. But then, you know, you have a cute baby a year later. So, well, maybe one more and kind of similar you, you what you do is you forget the painful part and you remember the fact that I really like how this thing turned out this you know this baby is actually really cute <laughs> and then the pain that getting there doesn't seem so intense and then before you know it it's like we're doing it again so now eight years I've done eight pieces and uh, this is my seventh tonight 
Uh, so tell us a bit about this this new baby, as it were. Um, it's a suite for chamber orchestra. Were, what were new challenges this time around and what inspiration did you have in working through it? It was very difficult for me because with, uh, you know, I've written three concertos now and um, there was always models that I really loved. You know, when I was writing the violin concerto, you know, there was the holy grail of Shostakovich's first mm -hmm. violin concerto. And so there's always this holy grail piece, but um, I'd never written for chamber before. I've done two quartets, but I mean, technically quartets chamber, but I don't consider it. When I think of chamber music, I think of Stravinsky's, you know, mid-century, the stuff he was doing for interesting 12 pieces, eight pieces, you know, 16 pieces, and that type of thing. And so I found myself wanting to soak things up because that's how I learn. You know, again, I, I don't have training, you know, when when I wrote my cello concerto for Gautier Capison, you know, two years ago, you know, I just started lessening the cello concertos and submerging myself in it and going, oh, I'm just going to make him crazy with this. I'm going to like, this is going to be so much fun. And, but for the chamber works, I was either finding they're either pre 19th century. There's a lot that music, as much as I respect it, doesn't speak to me. Um, my musical life sprung, you know, 1913 and, thereafter. And then um, you have a lot of modern music, which is just very different, and which I, I like. And, uh, you know, my percussion concerto was really inspired a lot by, you know, uh, Terry Riley and, um, you know, Steve Reich and, you know, composers like that. But I was looking for something that, no, this is going to be a small orchestra. And then the, the really terrifying thing is one clarinet, one flute, one bassoon, one French horn, one trumpet, I was like, oh my God, I've never done that before. So I was trying to figure out how to wrangle it. It's like, okay, if it's just strings, it's like, I could deal with that. But all these ones of, and again, I was listening and I kept finding works that would inspire me end up being Stravinsky. And then I, the Stravinsky chamber works are so, I would just tie myself into knots. <laughs> I would listen to a piece and I would start writing and before I know it, I'm like completely tripped up in circles. And it's like, I, you know, I get myself painted to the corner of a room that I can't get out of. And I said, okay, you know, I, I just, Stravinsky's not helping me here because he's so far beyond in how he could lock many things together, constantly playing around each other at the same time. He, he just had a brain that was way beyond mine. And so finally, I just started to go, just have fun with it. And, um, and I did, and I finally just started finding a rhythm. And it, you know, it's a pretty light piece, it's a fun piece. I felt that a lot of, even a lot of Stravinsky's chamber music that I was listening to was actually pretty, you know, so it was actually kind of fun, weird. But this lightness to yeah. it, like this, almost this humor to it. Yes, exactly right. And so I felt that gave me permission to take a similar kind of at least tonality to the music of having it be rather fun and a lightness to it and a bit of humor in it, just exactly as you're saying. Well, in that process, like I've, I've been studying the score and I'm very excited for tonight's performance, but the way that you treat all the melodic material, there are all these, I see like these cyclical connections between all of the movements. And it's almost this Bartokian way to me, the way it all comes back and they realign and reshift throughout. And I'm just wondering how that process came about for you as you worked it all out. I, I don't plan it out. Um, I don't actually plan out anything that I write uh, for concert. It's like, I just listen to a lot of music that I really like, and then I start improvising. And so my process ends up being the same, whether it be, you know, a, a big concerto or whether it be like my piano quartet, you know, for just four pieces, but it's still, I go through the same process. I'm listening to things, I'm getting excited by this and that, and then I just start improvising. And I might start with between eight and 12 short compositions. And then I'll go, okay, so here's a bunch of stuff. Now let me pause and go back and look at what did I, what was number one, two, three, and start to write a little more. And I'll find that number one, number three, number six, and number eight are starting to expand. And now, rather than just being like a 30, 40 second idea, now it's, oh, well, this is like 
is developing into something. And I find that certain of, of the pieces tend to just evolve. And some of them, just, I'm just hitting a dead end going, no, it was an interesting idea, but it doesn't want to be more than 30 seconds. You know, it's just a short idea. And others just take on a life. And then I start focusing on those. And then I see, can I put these three, four, five pieces together and make a cohesive element? And I think I have <laughs> all my concerto, my concertos follow the same thing. And I realize I can't get away from it. And it's all because of Shostakovich's first, <laughs> you know, the first and the fourth movement kind of relate to each other. There's a stylistic uh, sense of what they are and how they develop and move. And the second and the third go this way and this way. You know, the second movement is like insane. And the third movement is like so soulful, mm -hmm. you know, that it's one of the most soulful things I've ever heard in my life. And yet the second movement almost feels like it could be like Carl Stalling, like crazy <laughs> cartoon music. And so I'm kind of OCD and I, you know, get uh, pulled into symmetry. And so the symmetry of one and four speaking to each other, two and three going different directions makes perfect sense to me. So as often as I try to get away from that, it keeps coming back because there's a symmetry. Well, I mean, you can just see that, you know, symmetry, I'm obsessed with symmetry. I can't just put things on me. They have to relate to each other. And um, so I, I similarly found myself with a a f idea for a first and a fourth movement. And I, I said, I know, I feel like this could end it. I definitely want this to start it. And then the second and third kind of fell into place. And uh, I, I struggled a bit with the third movement. Is it too silly? And I go, oh. I I'll, I'll wait till rehearsal. I'll see how the Orpheus <laughs> Ensemble, if they're looking at it and they're going, rolling their eyes, I'm just gonna go strike the third movement. <laughs> but if they don't, if they can tolerate it and they're into it, I'll see how it plays. So that's how I put it together. It's really just dive in and feel my way through it. Don't like think my way through it. At least for me, that's just how I function. That's how I, I work with every film score, you know, 110 films. I don't block it all out. I find my major themes um, and I'll pick maybe three or four scenes in the film. And of those scenes, I know I'm going to have my major thematic material. I obviously want to know by the time I get to the end and I have a finale piece that I've got the material that will deliver. I don't want to start with something that I like and get to the end and go, it just doesn't quite come home, you know? So once I have those three or four pieces and I got my themes and sense blocked out, I just start with the first cue in the movie and I just start running in order and I just see where they take me. And that's the delight in writing is see where they take me. And the similarity between film music often and uh, certainly all the classical music is it starts with a heavy push and a desperation of like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get it. And I feel like I'm pushing a boulder uphill or a train really. And then at a certain point, I've got some momentum going and now it's kind of coasting along. I'm still pushing, but it's a lot easier pushing because now it's starting to, and then if I'm lucky, it's going to start downhill and now I'm holding on. <laughs> and that's the part, that's the parts that I long for because I don't know what's going to, suddenly something happens and I go, I don't know what that is, but I'm not going to question it. It's mm -hmm. happening for a reason. I'm just going to let it go. And that's the fun part. It's like now I'm following the piece of music mm -hmm. rather than making it fit in, in an exact framework that I had pre-intended. In that same vein, in studying the score, I. I see all of these details that to me, you're thinking so much about the performer and how they're going to react to the score. Even the first movement, there are so many tempo markings where you say this tempo, but also plus this speed, like of at the very least, it needs to be faster in this particular, the instance I'm thinking of. So how are you thinking about the performers, uh, especially in your concert music when you're writing it? or editing it, orchestrating it, just all of the, that well, process. Well, I mean, my music just tends to be very busy. You know, I always used to joke with my agent, if I were getting paid by the note on a film score, <laughs> I'd be like super rich, because there's so many notes <laughs> in it crammed in there. But I, I have a kind of a frenetic brain, and I like writing stuff that gets intricate and 
Uh, but I do try to think of how will the musician play this, and or is it even playable? And sometimes I have to go to the musicians and go, is this thing I'm thinking of even playable? And they'll say either yes or no, but if you make a slight alteration here, you know, certainly when I'm doing concertos, you know, I'm working with the soloists in that regard, you know, it's like there's, they'll be like, well, this particular fingering is not quite possible, but if I finger it like this and this, and at first I thought, oh, that's horrible, I'm not doing my job, and then my violinist said, let me show you uh, Brahms' violin concerto, with, it was his name, Joachim, um, how do you pronounce? Uh, uh, Joan jo Joachim. What? Yes, um, his notes all over the place, and, and I said, trust, she said, trust me, they work with their musicians, even Shostakovich. Yes, so I said, okay, if Brahms and Shostakovich are working with their players to give them, you know, corrections and ideas, then I don't have to feel bad about it. But, you know, sometimes I just have to get input, um, you know, especially if I'm writing piano parts, you know, there occasionally I'll write this little sentence, you know, look, for these two bars, I need three hands. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah, right, yeah, I can see that. We'll have to pull the Brahms for you next time because we actually have the manuscript with Joachim's And I've only seen the book annotations. of that, you know, the printing mm -hmm. of that. And it really made me feel better, you know, that, yes, they, you know, uh, musician feedback is not a shameful thing to have to, like, go and say, you know, help me with this figuration here. Help me in, and that, you know, I love the fact that Joachim would go back and go, X, X, you know, like that X stuff out. And some of those problems just ignore. Exactly. <laughs> just go, no, I know you don't like it, but it's in. We're going to do it. We're going to do it, exactly. Oh, as you worked on the piece, were there other unexpected developments in the, in the suite? I and mean, you talked about the third movement being unexpectedly humorous, maybe, but yeah, what that, other that was unexpected? the iffy one, you know. And so I was still uncertain for quite a while whether I needed to write another movement can the third movement, and so in case I had the jettison it, that I'd have something else to work. And then finally I just decided, let's see how it plays, you know, play it once. You know, the, the beautiful thing about concert music um, is that you can go back and develop it more. You know, with the film music, you write it, it's recorded, it's gone forever, that ship has sailed. And um, I believe it was, uh, there's, I mean, I, I, in what I've been learning is that there's, there's so many pieces that went through so many changes mm -hmm. between its first performance and second and third. Mm -hmm. um, Sibelius, famously, in uh, his violin concerto, I guess that was an extreme version where it was kind of tragic, the first mm -hmm. performance, and really reshaped things and brought it back into what is now Sibelius's concerto. Um, so I always I try to remember that. You know, this is a first performance. There will, there will undoubtedly be things that I'm, I'll be surprised, as I've heard in rehearsal, I'll go, ah, that actually worked. And there's some moments where I'm going to go, I may have to retool that a bit, and I will. But that's the beauty of this as an art form. It can, it can continue to evolve. God knows, Stravinsky did... <laughs> many reorchestrations. <laughs> many reorchestrations, exactly. Mm -hmm. Decades later, yeah. in many cases. And I'm told that, you know, what we hear as the Rite of Spring, famously, you know, in all of our DNA, musical DNA, was not really the first performance of the Rite of Spring at all. And there were elements there, but I'm told it was quite different. Yeah, there's sort of this excitement in new music of it's new, nobody's heard it before, the liveness factor of it all. I think we hear and perform music in a different way when it's like that. Yeah, and, and because it's not like theater, we're gonna have like a month of rehearsals, then take it out of town and retool it for before it goes to Broadway. You know, you get two days. There's not a lot of retooling you can do on the spot, you know, with a couple of days. And that's the reality of all, every classical or concert piece that I've done. And so you have to go, all right, we'll just get it to sound as good as it can. And the areas where I have problems, I'll take it back to the drawing board and I'll, redo this, I'll change the orchestration for this section where I got a bit muddy or could clarify something better. I may even cut some bars, you know, like you were showing me the manuscript of, uh, who had the cut? Oh, Proko well, Prokofiev. Prokofiev. Prokofiev had cut out in what he sent to the publisher. Yes, exactly. Even. So, you know, I may have a few of those 
I'm going to do it just like in the Prokofiev manuscript with a big X. <laughs> Cut out with four <laughs> exclamation marks. Um, as you've seen today, like the library has one of the best collection of music. We've mentioned several of the manuscripts uh, this afternoon. And why is it valuable, do you think, for audiences, for people, for performers to engage with the library and its collections and those these kinds of materials? What do we get out of it? I mean, you can actually see the process. You know, when you listen to the recordings, you hear the end result. Um, when you look at the manuscript, often, as we did today, you can actually see the process. Um, and that's amazing to be able to actually get a glimpse of the process of what this piece looked like and where changes were made and things were corrected or crossed out and you know that's just priceless being here at the library of congress and seeing all of the collection materials we have seeing the beautiful jefferson building i'm wondering if you have any personal connections to libraries growing up or in your past that have resonated with you today or that resonate with you as you're here with us at the library well, it just brings back wonderful memories. It's like being in the ultra, ultra library. You know, I loved library as a kid, um, but that's all I could really say. It was just a, a place, it was a pleasurable place to be. Uh, I liked the smell. I liked the quietness of it. And I loved being able to find books and take them, and have my little card and check them out. You know, it was a great, it was a big part of my childhood was going to the library. You know, in my generation, obviously, you know, you can't just, bring it up on your Kindle, like in, <laughs> in a minute. Uh, and uh, this is like the mega ultra version of what I think of as a library in like the most wildly enhanced and elaborate way. Uh, just the last question I have is, you wear many compositional hats throughout your career from Boingo Boingo and the Mystic Nights to film and now concert music. What's next? What's next on the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, really just between uh, film music and concert music, it was already keeping me, you know, not taking any vacations for the last decade. Um, and then since uh, quarantine and COVID, I began writing rock music again and did a, an album. And so now I'm doing that as well. So. Two balls, juggling two balls was already like, going, oh, this is gonna, this is, now it's three. And it's like, oh boy, I don't know how I'm gonna work this balance out, you know, with all three of these things, but I'm trying to. And uh, again, I'm just trying to challenge myself. It's just, you know, it's like you keep yourself moving or you become, you die artistically, you become a relic. And I know that I'm at that point where I could, rest on my laurels and you know films that people like and I don't have to do anything more but I'm not ready to do that <laughs> and so you know I I'm loving the fact that I'm at this weird place in my life where I can go from playing the cello concerto with Gautier Capuçon um, fly back to um, the US and within two weeks be on stage at Coachella with an electric guitar on me. <laughs> and then to be the next night after my second week at Coachella, having the second performance of my percussion concerto with Colin Curry in uh, uh, Costa Mesa, and like literally showing up with dust <laughs> still <laughs> on me from, from the desert. And I go, this is insane. I don't know if anybody's got the pleasure of like literally going from Vienna concert stage of the world premiere of a, of a cello concerto to the rock and roll stage, well, barely 10 days later. And um, that kind of extreme juxtaposition is what I love. I love contrast. And uh, so I'm just considering myself blessed right now to having these experiences. Uh, I'm not the most famous composer. I'm far from the most famous rock and roll artist. I'm far from you know, the most famous film composer. But I get to do all these things simultaneously in a way that I don't know if anybody else has quite had the same experience. And so, knock wood, you know, I just consider myself to be very lucky to be having this 
opportunity for this moment in my life. Well, thank you so much. I'm already scared about the show now tonight. Now that I've seen everything, it's like a, so I'm already thinking like maybe I'll just run back home before the concert. And so <laughs> at the end of it, I'll already be like in bed with my covers pulled over my head. Did they hate it? Um, so uh, thank you for having me.